you better have your money in Bitcoin. How do I ensure that in my last years of my life, I can go where I want, do what I want, when I want, and I'll have money to do it? Dear God of volatility, thank you very much for bringing the number goes up. If the United States government wants to, they can't screw with me too bad. When I sold my house, I had more money and smash bought Bitcoin. How many Bitcoin do I have to accumulate to retire one day? The first thing that somebody has to do if they want to retire well is retire without debt. If a major black swan event happens and all the banks decide they want to close and freeze your funds, what are you going to do? Well, with Bitcoin, you've got freedom. If you only got one passport, you don't own it. Your government turns it on and off just like a CBDC. So if they want you to come home, they just say your passport's not valid. No country in the world will let you in. The number goes up quicker and I can spend it. I'm trying to die broke because it isn't the one who dies with the most toys wins. It's the guy who dies with the most memories and the most laughs and the best time. This is a debt-driven society. The countries are in debt. The states are in debt. The cities are in debt. The people are in debt. All you have to do to get ahead in this life is get yourself out of goddamn debt. Debt equals death. What they should have did in 2008 during the great financial crisis, they should have let some of them banks fail. You know, on on the first day after Joe Biden was elected to office and he took office on January 20th of 2020. And on January 21st, I said, that's it. I'm out of here. So I <laughs> so I, I sold everything I owned. It take, took me 18 months. And by 18 months, I was totally divested of everything. And my whole thing was, how do I become free? I want to be free. I want to live my life. I've always lived my life with freedom in mind. And Bitcoin wasn't the first thing. It was the freedom was the first thing. And then I obtained a second citizenship for $130,000 on citizenship by investment. And then I said, how do I maintain my freedom? Because I want to go to where I'm treated best, sort of the old nomad capitalist routine. And I want to make sure by having a second passport in that. So Bitcoin came to me as how do I make sure that tyrannical government doesn't fuck up the last part of my life? Okay. I want, I want to know that if the United States government wants to, they can't screw with me too bad. They could get a little bit, but they ain't get much. They can take away your passport. See, if you only got one passport, you don't own it. Your government turns it on and off just like a CBDC. So if they want you to come home, they just say your passport's not valid. No country in the world will let you in. So I wanted to make sure I was free. And when I turned around, I said, well, how do I guarantee that I can go anywhere in the world and have money? Then I started doing my research into Bitcoin, which, you know, I had already poo-pooed in 2013 when it was brought to me as being something stupid. So I'd already said, oh, that's a Ponzi scheme. I just dismissed it and blah, 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 dumb, dumb, dumb. But in 2020, I started saying, I want to be, I want to make sure that I can go. I have a three day plan. What happens if the world takes a dump on your life? What would you do? Where would you go in three days? I've got the plan. Okay. As long as there's an airline to get me there, I've got a plan. So that's why I really want to touch on is the Bitcoin to me is freedom. Yeah, I love to pray to the God of volatility. Uh, I pray to him every day. I thank him for number goes up. That's all well and good. But more importantly than anything is that I can cross it in the borders and go to any one of 20 countries that I have already lined up that I can stay in. How did you come to that? Because you said like you thought it's a scam, it's, it's for, you thought it's a pyramid scheme. Well, like I said, in 2021, I said, I, or in 2020, I said, I'm going to get out of here. And it took me 18 months. I bought a second citizenship by investment, which cost about 130000 at the time from an East Caribbean community country called St. Lucia. 
but I wanted to make sure that I could be free. And I did not, I no longer trusted the United States government because they no longer go by the rule of law in the United States. They turned the law into a weapon against political opponents, which I never thought would have happened. And uh, they're using that uh, lawfare right now to, to, to silence people. Censorship's at an all-time high. The freezing of assets, I think, is, is a total possibility at any time. That's why I keep less than 10% of my liquid net worth in fiat currencies. And that's broken down between the United States dollar and the Thai bot where I'm in Thailand. But I keep less than 10% there. The rest is all in Bitcoin uh, or it's in Bitcoin derivatives because I'm a firm believer that as long as you're still going to be a U.S. citizen, they have something called a Roth IRA. And if you have a Roth IRA, any profits that you make and anything in that IRA will never, ever, ever be taxed. You can make profits, you can trade, whatever. And within that Roth IRA, you can hold Bitcoin, you can hold Bitcoin ETFs, you can hold MicroStrategy stock, you can hold uh, Mara uh, mining stock, you can hold anything Bitcoin related you want in the, in the ETF for a tax advantage because it will never be taxed under the U.S. law if you're still a U.S. citizen. But I really wanted to find freedom. At the time, I said, you know, I don't trust the U.S. government. I don't trust the banks. I had put out a, uh, a YouTube video on fractional reserve banking back in 2020, and it was my biggest video of all time on number of views. Out of the, you know, I only had like 100 subscribers, and it did like almost 60,000 views, which was amazing on uh First, I did the the uh, the yuan from China being used to buy oil, and then I did the fact that fractional reserve banking for 400 years has been killing the banking system. The bank, the banks are gangsters, so I don't trust them. So I said, "How do I ensure that in my last years of my life I can go where I want, do what I want, when I want?" And I'll have money to do it. And there's nowhere else you can put your money and do that. You can't buy property. You can't take property with you. You can't. Property comes with insurance rates that go up every, every month or every year. Every time you renew a policy, it costs more. You have to maintain the property. You have to pay tax on the property every month. So I said, where am I going to put money that I trust? So I looked into places like Singapore Precious Metal Exchange, where you can actually buy gold and put in this vault in Singapore. And this vault looks like it's something off a James Bond movie. They hold gazillions of dollars worth of gold and platinum and silver in this place in Singapore. I looked at that and I said, well, that's that's all right. But. Now you got all your wealth in, in some place in Singapore, which is, is a safe place. It's a good hub. Uh, probably one of the best governments in the world. By the way, if you didn't know, Singapore probably pays, legitimately pays their politicians better than any other country in the world. You can actually have a good salary as a politician, uh, a competitive commercial grade type salary. And consequently, they don't have the corruption and, and they're known as the, you know, Switzerland of the Southeast Asia. You know, that doesn't solve the bill, but Bitcoin did. So I started buying Bitcoin after I did my research and I did hundreds of hours of research. I mean, even before I bought the first little bit. And then I went into dollar cost averaging every single day. Every single day I had programmable buy. And then when it went down low, I just smashed buy. And when it went lower, I'd smash buy again. It didn't matter. I took Michael Saylor's. It's never a bad time to buy Bitcoin. 
And, you know, when I sold my house, I had more money and smash bought Bitcoin. Uh, luckily, my house actually sold in, in June of 2022, which wasn't a horrible time to have a, a little bit of money to, to buy Bitcoin with. But my whole answer is, with Bitcoin, you can be free. And, you know, the thing I'd like to convey to people is you don't have to stay where you were born. You were born in a country, wherever that is. You don't have to stay there. And you don't have to move to a town next to you. You don't have to move to the state or province near you. You can move to another country. And uh, I moved over here, and I was planning to travel, but I loved it here. And this... I'm living in a pool villa that I know would cost 8000 a month if it was in a similar location in Florida and the United States, and I'm paying 2000 a month. I'm moving to one that just got completed that's even bigger with even a bigger pool, and it's, it's gorgeous. And I'm, st I'm still paying like $2,100 a month. So you can live in other parts of the world and you can take your money with you if it if you're living on a bitcoin standard and everything gets cheaper on a bitcoin standard i watched a youtube video the other day a guy was saying that he got a super deal here in thailand on a six bedroom six bath pool villa and he did i i met him i went over there i talked with him i saw it it's a beautiful place and he got this deal by paying a whole year in advance he got a super deal but then i put down on an excel sheet on my channel mark dash hannah on youtube and i did a whole video on it. i said if you just keep your money in bitcoin and pay the rent every month if bitcoin during this bull run goes up like this you're going to end up paying 40% of the rent that you actually paid because everything gets cheaper on a Bitcoin standard. And if it goes up even more, you're going to do better. If it goes up a little less, you're going to do a little bit less, but you are in the middle of a bull run. So why, why pay a whole year up front if you can keep your money? Now, this weekend, when you're making this, it was... Bitcoin was struggling to hang into $60,000. And right now, as I look, it's at $64,077. You take your money out of Bitcoin and you lost about 7 8% jump over a weekend. I went to bed on Friday night, woke up Saturday morning, and it was up like 3000 From where I've got a little screen, a little iPad that sits on the on the on the shelf over here and displays Bitcoin price all the time. So you keep your money in Bitcoin. You peel off just enough that you can live. That's all you need to do. And uh, you pray to the God of volatility. Oh, dear God of volatility, thank you very much for bringing the number goes up. Amen. Say hallelujah. So hallelujah. You, just, you, just, you just stay with it. And, and you... You know, if somebody tell, shows me an asset that performs better than Bitcoin, I may change. But then again, we're in an unstable world. You've got wars in the Middle East. You've got an aggressive China that would really love to have Taiwan in its back pocket and people rattling sabers over there. you got North Korea. you got Russia you know, trying to invade Ukraine and Ukraine trying to invade Russia. There's a lot of stuff going on. We don't know what black swan event will happen. But if you want to escape all that, you know, the one thing that all of those these things have in common, that they're in the northern hemisphere. Perhaps if the shit hits a fan, you want to go to Chile. Maybe you want to go to Argentina. Maybe you want to go somewhere else. But when you do, you want to have money when you get there. And if a major black swan event happens and all the banks decide they want to close and freeze your funds, what are you going to do? Well, with Bitcoin, 
you've got freedom. And we're built on a house of debt, uh, and there's no other second best asset. I'm sure you watched Mark Moss, and he just came out with this YouTube video on the black hole. And it's basically the black hole of other asset investments. And the best, the second best was the NASDAQ. And that only kept your head barely above the debasement of the U.S. dollar and inflation. Just barely. I mean, he does a really good job of explaining it. You know, he puts out a beautiful video and uh, people should watch it. But there is no second best investment to put your money in, especially if you want to be able to pick up, pack your bags, grab a plane, grab a boat, and get the hell out of wherever you're at. Now, I'm in Thailand. It's got a stable government. But in 2014, they had a military coup. It's got a relatively stable government now. I mean, I don't expect anything's ever, that anything's going to go bad. But if it did, I'd want to get out of here. And I'd want to have money where I go. So I'm not going to trust the fact that the fiat bank is going to be open or willing to give me my money. And that's the reason why uh, Bitcoin jumped up at me. I didn't actually go look. In fact, when they brought it to me, in two, a friend, poker player, brought it to me in 2013, said, Mark, we ought to buy some of this. And I said, ah, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's some, some scam. I'm not going to bother with it. You know, I knew everything. I was so smart. Yeah, dummy, 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 dummy. It's interesting for me. When, when, when you see, um, I think a lot of people in the West are actually like almost a little bit arrogant. They are like, oh, the banking system will continue. I live in the West. I live in whatever, Austria, US, uh, everything will be fine. And maybe it will be, maybe it won't, but you at least want to have the option to take your life savings. Like you want to have the option to take your financial energy with you. I, I'm also curious, like, why did you choose Thailand? Like there are a lot of different places and I did also a little bit of research of like, where could I go and citizenships and stuff like that. But why Thailand? There was, I did a ton of research. And when I was getting ready to leave the United States, I had 41 different countries that I thought were possibilities. There was a guy on YouTube named Chris Parker, who I had conversed with by email for a year and a half while I was selling everything because I had a lot of stuff tied up. I had to sell everything, you know, what am I going to do with 40 to guitars in my suitcase? Yeah, I had to sell everything. So it took 18 months and he keep, kept putting out videos and the people were just kind. And uh, they had uh, at the time a totally territorial tax system. And that seemed good. And here's the thing. I've got a pool right out. 25 feet from where I'm sitting is a pool. I can use it 365 days a year. It's beautiful here all the time. It's a little hot, but that's not going to kill me. Um, sometimes it's just gorgeous. I mean, the plants, it's like eternal spring here. The plants are always beautiful, blooming in different colors. And, you know, it's just wonderful of a place. I mean, there's beaches everywhere. If you want beaches, you go a few hours and you're in the mountains. You want a big city. Bangkok's one of the most visited cities in the world. It's got 18 million people. It's, it's got twice the geographic area of New York City. You know, if you want a big city environment, there you go. If you want to live in the country like I do. I live like 12 kilometers from the beach, but if you looked outside for the first kilometer or two, you'd think you were in the country somewhere. I mean, it's like day and night from being the bustling, you know, Pattaya or Jom Tiam in Thailand. So you get away from it all and you can do that on 30% of the, what it costs to live in the United States. I get, two inch thick ribeye locally raised fed on grass delivered frozen shrink wrapped and vacuum sealed 
to my door for $5.40 per pound. In America, that's four times as much. $5.40 a pound for grass-fed ribeyes. I mean, so if you're retired and fun employed like me, I came over here, I actually had a job. I was a cloud engineer managing uh, big enterprise systems in the cloud. I had a job till, till I became fun employed. But if you're actually retired and you can live to a very high standard on one third the price, why, why not give it a try if you like it? If I don't like it, I got suitcases. I'll fill them up. I'll go somewhere else. But if I do, I get to take my money with me. If the world breaks out into a world war, I get to leave. I get to go to Want to go to Vanuatu? Nobody will bother you down there. Most people couldn't find it on the map with a magnifying glass if you gave them an hour. So figure out where you want to go and, and have a plan that if the world goes to hell in a handbag, believe me, we got a lot of problems in this world. We're skating on thin ice. I hope nothing ever happens. But you got things in at least three parts of the world that could explode at any particular time. Whoever they elect in Washington, D.C. isn't going to make a big difference in that. I mean, on a scale of 1 to 10, both sides don't come up to 1, really. One side's way better for crypto. You know, the, Donald Trump is, has, has come around, and he wants to make uh, transactions in Bitcoin to be a non-taxable event just like cash and if he and that would greatly help uh because i still pay u.s taxes you know i'm gonna have to do that unless i want to give up my u.s citizenship which i could do but i don't really i see no big advantage to do it i'm not going to do it just to beat a couple bucks of tax if there there is some advantages to still having that u.s passport but if it gets worse i'll leave you know, I want freedom. I want my money to go with me. And Bitcoin is where you can you can store your wealth. It ain't cash. I don't buy anything with Bitcoin. I mean, I know there are people who says you can get a debit card and you can trans, you know, you can peel off a little bit for that or the other. I try to do as little peeling off of Bitcoin in any taxable account. I've never sold a single Satoshi that I had to pay tax on legally. I try only keep it in non-taxable accounts like Roth IRA and try to do it that way. But as far as buying actual hard physical Bitcoin and holding in multi-sig storage, and that's one thing I want to stress to your people out there. Do not make the mistake of thinking just because you have a multi-sig storage and you think you're you're smart, you can put all your wealth into, into one place. Have a few multiple SIG storage accounts. Put your put your 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 uh, hardware wallets on separate continents in safe places. Don't put all your eggs in, in one address or one basket or or you know, I've, I have people saying, well, you, can, you don't need that many hardware wallets if you want. You can save a few bucks and you can just have multiple addresses on one hardware wallet. No, you spread that stuff out and you keep your money safe. Don't put all them eggs in one basket, no matter how good the basket is. I mean, you're not storing your keys in Fort Knox with the, you know, U.S. Army at Fort Campbell surrounding Fort Knox. So protect yourself. Take a little time. It's not as easy as having your money in the bank, but it's a whole lot safer if you go about it the right way. And you can have freedom. You know, my definition of success, Robin, has always been the same. I want to do what I want, when I want, and how I want. When I was 20 years old, that was my that was my idea of success. I want to do what I want, when I want, and how I want. And to do that requires cash or 
Bitcoin that you convert into your local currency of choice. Maybe I convert it someday into the East Caribbean a community dollar. And maybe I'm living in, you know, British Virgin Islands or St. Kitts or St. Lucia or Dominica or Belize. Who knows where it'll be? But Bitcoin will convert into the local currency. I can go out and, and seek food and shelter. Whatever else I need. Just peel off enough into the local currency that you use right away before they can debase it like the U.S. dollar's doing. I mean, we've lost 23.6% as far as I can calculate in four years of buying power with the U.S. dollar. And, and you still got people who I consider just stupid who say, oh, man, I can get 5% interest from on no-risk treasury. Die. Yeah, I can lose 12% a year. Yeah, Michael Saylor's got his act together. Nobody explains it better than he. I mean, I think if anybody convinced me it was him, I'd love to shake his hand one day. Michael, thank you. You, you show me the way. 90% Bitcoin, I will be fine. I think the number goes up quicker and I can spend it being a sensible person that that's for sure and he's actually really good like it's it's fascinating he's in so many interviews and he always finds a new way to explain explain bitcoin um i want to go into the retirement topic with you also a little bit um you said you also get a lot of comments from like young folks 29 30 35 maybe that lo look like at retirement at like maybe 50 55 60 65 um and they look for bitcoin as a as a means to do that. And there's always, I think, a lot of questions coming up. Going, oh, how many Bitcoin do I have to accumulate to retire one day? Um, what will be the growth rate? And I think you, I think in one video you said like you expect like a five, 50 percent uh, growth rate. Um, how do you, I mean, right now you are 90 percent in Bitcoin. You probably don't care that much how much the, the volatility and the growth goes. But for those people who are asking, for those people who want to plan for retirement, um, what do you say to them? I say, you do what you can and you put it on paper. I just did a video the other day of how powerful it is when you write a plan down and you take a piece of paper, and a pen and use your hand. Don't type it out. You can do that later. If you feel like it, just take a piece of paper and a pen and write down your thoughts and write down your plan and then take a piece of tape and stick it up somewhere. You'll look at it every day. Now, Back in the day, I had a guy that had this picture of a convertible Jaguar XKE from the 1970s. He had on his wall in his office. And it was just his favorite car. He said, someday I'm going to own it. And he went out to buy shelves for his business. And in the corner, there was a car covered up. And he looked underneath of it. It was a convertible Jaguar. He left the auction, he went, he borrowed money, didn't tell his wife, and he bought the car and took it home, didn't buy the shelves. When you put it on paper and you put it right there in front of you, that's what you want to do, you'll make it happen. Now, I don't know that there's an exact, you know, I've got people coming over here in Thailand who are living and living on 1500 US dollars a month for their budget. They've got, you can get a condo here. It might only be 30 square meters, but it'll be a, uh, a studio or a one bedroom condo and they'll live on 1500 a month. Now my budget over here is closer to six or 7,000 a month, but depends on what you want and what you think your budget has, the type of lifestyle you want to live. But the compounding of time and with services out there like Swan Bitcoin, that I used for years and you can program and you just tell them I want to buy X number of dollars a day, or I want to buy X number of dollars every week or X number of dollars every month. And they'll take it out of your checking account and they'll make the buy for you. And when you get enough uh, saved up at Swan, they'll automatically send it to your cold storage or your storage vault that you can get with them, wherever you want to do, but don't 
Don't buy $35 a day and try to transfer it every day and get small UTXOs. Just let it build up till you get a, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars worth of it and then take it to hardware storage. And, uh, so you got some, some consolidation of UTXOs and they'll do that for you for free. But I tell people, you've got time on your side. You know, just quit, get out of debt. Quit buying cars on time. Quit buying boats on time. Quit buying, you know, everything that you want. Have some, some time dilation to where you say, I'm saving my money. I'm not going to go in debt because if you're, if you're sitting there carrying credit card debt and you're carrying student loan debt, and you're carrying a car loan and you're doing all this stuff, it's going to be hard for you to accumulate any type of wealth, whether it's in Bitcoin or anything else. Okay. The first thing I tell any young kid is get debt free, do without just for a while, do without. Cause once you do without and you get debt free, you'll be surprised how good you can live. You have the money to buy it or you have the money to lease it and you don't have any other debts. That's the big thing. And once you get debt free, look in your life and see if there's some place that you're spending, you know, you're spending $20, $30, $40, you know, a week or a day. Are you spending $10 a day at Starbucks and at McDonald's that you could really do without? Well, then buy $50 for a Bitcoin a week. You know, that'll be $2,500 worth of Bitcoin in a year. Just that, it's a start. And if Bitcoin in the next 15 or 20 years, 20 X's, then that 2,500 becomes, I mean, and you, you keep buying it every month. You do what you can. But the first thing that somebody has to do if they want to retire well is retire without debt. This is a debt driven society. The countries are in debt. The states are in debt. The cities are in debt. The people are in debt. And all you have to do to get ahead in this life is get yourself out of goddamn debt. Debt equals death. It's a slow death by a thousand cuts. And you won't believe how good your life is if you don't have people calling you up on the phone, dunning you to make that next payment. You're behind. Send you another payment. How are you ever going to get ahead there? Hell, you better not invest in Bitcoin. You better find some shit coin to thousand X's overnight if you want to get out of that. Get out of debt first. Or at least if you can't get out of debt, take a little bit and put it away every day or every week. And use a place like Swan to do it. Eventually, it'll end up to be real money. That's the bottom line. I got out of debt when I was in my thirties and I was a fool for debt before my thirties. You know, if I saw something, I wanted it. I want it now, you know, Oh shit. They'll put that on payments. I had good credit record. You know, they'll give me another credit book. I keep paying, but you know, there was one point in my life when I was real young, I looked down and I said, I'm spending $14,000 a month on bills. What the fuck's wrong with me? I don't need four cars. You know, I got cut back somewhere. And, and you know, the first step towards retirement is getting out of debt and nobody wants to talk about that. They all think that, you know, you have to invest. And that's a sick part about this world with the debasement of fiat currencies, Robin, and the buying power just going down every single month, the buying power of the US dollar, of the Euro, I don't care what fiat currency it is, the buying power is going down almost every month because almost every country's in debt. And it's the debt that's dragging everybody down. And if you, it's a shame because you can't even save what you earn.
if you go out and you earn money and you save it in the fiat currency, you can't get ahead. You can be a doctor and be behind. I mean, it is not hard right now. I know some people who are medical professionals who spent eight years in school and they're struggling financially. I mean, they are doctors and they're struggling financially. You know why? Because they're in debt. They got a beautiful car. They got a beautiful house. They got probably got a nice boat. They take nice vacations. They put it on the credit card, but went right down to it. They're struggling because they're living above their means, just like the countries are, just like the, the school districts are, just like the cities are, and that's all around the world. Everybody wants to live above their means. If they just lived within their means for a while and invested for a while, they could get to a point where they could live a much nicer life and not be in debt. I mean, that's everybody wants to look at Bitcoin as a magic answer. And it might be if, uh, you know, if I was the United States government, and I got old pal up there on the printing press able to print fiat. I'd say print me off two hundred and fifty billion dollars. I'm going to go buy us some Bitcoin. And that stuff's number going to go up. The first country that comes in and does it is going to be a genius. I mean, a real country. I love El Salvador. I think they've done a wonderful job. I think that president down there deserves a pat on the back. But let's face it, he's a he, El Salvador is a little bitty, teeny, teeny country with a budget that the United States goes in debt that much money. By the time we get off this call today, they've already blown that much money during the call. I mean, that's their whole the whole GDP, annual GDP of El Salvador. Yeah, you know, the United States goes in debt every day that much money. I mean, the first real country, Russia, China, the US, England, something with Japan, something with a GDP that can print their own fiat. First one that buys themselves a boatload of Bitcoin will make a dent in their own debt. I mean, if I could print the money, I'd be buying every day. Fuck buying the dips. I'm buying, period. I don't care what the price is. Let me print the money and let me buy it. How can the governments be so damn dumb? They get to print it. I don't want anybody's currency that, that they can print at will for free. It has no value. I mean, the fact that they could print it for free and go buy Bitcoin... How stupid do they have to be not to take that deal? If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. And uh, it, it's so fascinating because um, when you see at nation state level, I mean, you have the US elections coming up. Uh, we have the national conference where so many politicians talked and it seems like US is moving more and more uh, in, in favor of crypto and Bitcoin. Um, where do you see, like, if you have to bet, like, do, what major country will be the, the first mover uh, eventually? I think if Trump gets elected, the one thing, the one thing I will say about Trump was, for the most part, he did everything he said he was going to do during his first term. He tried anyway. If he said he was going to do it, he tried to do it. If he got blocked by, you know, some court or somebody sued him to stop him or whatever, he tried. And if he says he's going to create a national uh, strategic reserve for Bitcoin, I believe he will. Now, he wasn't strong enough. I think he really needs to come out and say, we need to buy Bitcoin. We need to buy it now. Okay. So we're just going to, we're not going to buy it a small amount we're gonna we're gonna leg in and we're gonna get there we're gonna we're gonna buy it we're gonna do michael sailor style you know let's buy a billion a day for the next 250 days get it over with okay in five years they're gonna be real happy with that investment in 10 years they're gonna be even more happy with that investment and the fear of missing out by there's only gonna be room for two significant sovereign states to get into Bitcoin. I don't think you're going to get more than two 20% holders. And if they do get to 20%, they're going to spend dearly to get there because there's just not that kind of supply. But it makes a whole lot of sense but yeah, it doesn't matter what the U.S. does. If they don't do the same thing that I just cautioned these young people to do and get out of debt, if they continue, you look, I don't want them to cut Social Security. I get Social Security. I paid into it for 40 years. Now, I get Social Security. You pay into that. That's not a gift. That's not a give out. They take money out of your check in the United States every single check you get for Social Security. But if they have to cut entitlements, including Social Security, Medicare, and whatever they have to do, the, the government's got to do it. The government's got to get themselves into a balanced budget that's actually collecting more from its citizens than it spends. But it can't just go collect more for its citizens. It's got to stop spending. It's got to cur curtail what it's spending because they're already taxing everybody to death. And, and that's a fact. So if they don't do that, there's no hope. Sooner or later, the cards will collapse and they need to get rid of, they need to get rid of the Federal Reserve for trying moder modern monetary policy. MMT doesn't work. The Federal Reserve is there to be the buyer of last resort of government debt. Their main job, that bullshit at 2%, 2% so they can rob you and keep them full, uh, full employment being their other mandate is so that they can keep full employment from people that they can rob them of their money. It's all based on that. The only thing they do do of value is they create the illusion that people are buying U.S. debt. When the Treasury offers U.S. Treasury debt and nobody steps in and takes the bid, the Federal Reserve comes in and they buy it and put it on their balance sheet to give the illusion that the bond market's fully functional. They are the buyers of last resort. In 2008, 
the Fed had about $800 billion balance sheet. It went up to $9 trillion balance sheet. Now it's down around $7 trillion. Without the, the U.S. government overspending, people say the U.S. economy is growing. The GDP is growing. How much of the GDP is government spending? The government is spending money it don't have, money it's borrowing from other uh, countries and other investors, and then they include that in the GDP. If the government didn't overspend more than they had, the GDP would not be growing. It would probably be in a recession. As Booth says, everything's deflationary. They're propping that up through overspending. And if they don't stop that, London Bridge will come down. Somebody will pull out that last stick in the Jenga pile, and it's going to all end up on the floor sooner or later. And that's why my money's in Bitcoin, because when it does, I'm going to lose 10% of what I own at best. Worst case scenario. And probably only half of that, because I got probably got half of, of that money in in Thai banks instead of U.S. banks. So hopefully only the U.S. collapse and I can get the money out of the Thai bank quick enough to <laughs> before I lose it all. You know, and, but it's going to come down. Something's going to happen. Probably a war because war corrects all deficits. I mean, it, it does. Uh, that's that's how they juice up the economy. They've done it. They did in World War One. There's no coincidence that World War I happened right after the Federal Reserve was created in, in 1913. You think about J.P. Morgan was financing both sides of World War I. It's all about the bankers. It always has been. You can't trust them. Thank you, Satoshi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you People think are going to take a bath. Do you think we could, uh, I mean, that's like far out in the future, but if like in 50 years or uh, uh, later than that, live on kind of a Bitcoin standard where Bitcoin is our medium of exchange and unit of account, do you think that wars will be eliminated or maybe uh, limited? Well, let me put it this way. If you couldn't finance for war, you couldn't have the wars. And in World War Two, it was a major work for the United States government to get their people to go to work to build the bombers and then take their salary and buy war bonds with it. They literally had people go into the factories and working and then conning them out of their money that they paid them to build the bombers to buy war bonds to put back into the war effort. Okay, you have to get the population to agree to it. And if, if you make them agree to funding a war out of their own pocket, it's, it has to be a, a cause, a righteous cause that they totally believe in. You're not going to get all these funding through debt like they did. They came off the gold standard because of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War sold no war bonds. The Vietnam War was ran in debt. And then they decide, and then the other countries came for their gold, and Nixon took us off the gold standard. Think about this, Robin. No fiat currency in the world today was created as a fiat currency. It wasn't backed by gold or silver. None, not a single one. They all started off on the gold standard, or at minimum, a silver standard. And then they took away being backed by gold. In fact, we had the same sort of problem. In 1913, most of the countries came off the gold standard until we got back on the gold standard after World War II. Only, I, I think, Sweden was the only country that stayed on the gold standard until 1934, or was it Switzerland? One of those two. Uh, Swiss I get Switzerland. I, I get those two countries confused in my mind. But Switzerland stayed in 1934. Almost all the other major countries came off the gold standard in 1913. Happened to be right around the time the Federal Reserve was created. No fiat currency 
could ever be created without the backing of gold originally or the backing of, of a precious metal or the backing of some uh, physical commodity that gave it worth to the public. But now nothing has any worth and there's no limit on the borrowing and they keep paying. You know, when the numbers get this big, I ran like seven businesses over my life. When the numbers get big enough, you can always borrow from Peter to pay Paul. And then you borrow from Mary to pay Peter. And then you borrow from John to pay Mary and then borrow from Mary again to pay Peter. When the numbers are big enough, you can juggle and keep them plates in the air for a very, very long time. And the U.S. government and all this debt that they have, if they did it for another 40 years, it wouldn't surprise me none because the numbers are just so large that, you know, if it collapsed tomorrow, it wouldn't surprise me any. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised either way. But sooner or later, it's unsustainable. So if you don't have your money in assets that you can control, and, and for the people like Grant, Incard or Grant Cardone, who's got all the property, well, when the banks all collapse in the United States, what good's all that property in the United States going to be? What good? Nobody's going to be able to pay the rent. Landlords aren't going to be able to pay the mortgage. If the banks collapse, even the government ain't bailing people out. What they should have did in 2008 during the great financial crisis, they should have let some of them banks fail. Oh, it would have been brutally bloody. People would have took a bath. People would have been suffering. But there's no suffering. Bankers never lose. You cannot have a fair society where there is never anybody in of importance who ever loses. They take wild chances. They play with derivatives. They con everybody into buying them. And when the whole thing goes tits up, nobody's held responsible and only Lehman Brothers fail. They bail out Merrill Lynch, who, by the way, at that time had 49.8% of BlackRock stock. So they own 49.8% of BlackRock and Bank of America bought them out because of the BlackRock stock. So they should have let Merrill Lynch fail. They should have let Lehman Brothers fail and anybody else they took the house of cars down with them and we wouldn't be in this situation we're in now. Every once in a while, somebody has to go bankrupt and pay the piper, piper for bad policy. Nobody's ever willing to do that. Nobody's ever willing to let something hit rock bottom. If you've got somebody who's addicted to drugs and you just keep giving them all the drugs that they want, they will never get off drugs. You have to let them have withdrawal symptoms. You have to let them crash. You have to let them sit with their head over the toilet for once in a while and let the world pay that pain that that is due. And until that happens, Robin, you better have your money in Bitcoin because the people who do are going to be like fat cats after the 1929 crash who had all their money at the time buried in their mattress. You know, if you had all your money buried in your mattress in 1929 when the stock market crashed in the United States, you were a wealthy individual. Bitcoin's like the mattress. I love that a lot. You have really good uh, uh, comparisons. Um, one last thing I want to get into with you is um, you mentioned it a little bit with real estate. I noticed that you said you, you rent. And uh, it's really interesting because when you look at real estate prices, they all went up through the roof. But when you measure the same real estate prices uh, in Bitcoin, for example, the average US home was 32 Bitcoin five years ago. Now it's like six Bitcoin. Uh, and I had last time a bit, uh, an interview with Peter Dunworth. He said like, oh, um, a uh, house in, in a million, uh, a house in um, 20 years, you probably can buy for a million Satoshis. If the world goes crazy, maybe even 100,000 Satoshis to you uh, average home price. 
um, why do you um, rent and not buy? And did you, while you were searching for assets, also consider other um, investments like real estate ETFs, gold and stuff like that? And why did you then uh, uh, go with Bitcoin and go with renting and not uh, buying real estate in Thailand? Well, first off, in Thailand, ring real estate is a bad investment a bad business for the people who own the real estate. The average return on a piece of real estate in Thailand is about 5% a year, whereas in the United States, it might be 12% a year. Well, how are you going to come out ahead with a 5% return on investment? Now, if you think about it, I first came to this uh, pool villa, and the, the rent was like $1,900 a month. So I did that in November of 2023. Where was the price of Bitcoin in 2023? In November, 30,000 or less. I don't know. I, I'd be guessing. But now it's looking like it's 63,965. So let's say it tripled. Okay. If I would have took and bought this condo, I could have left the money in there and tripled it. And by the way, this condo here is gorgeous. And the one I'm moving into ne in next November here coming up, I already got set up. It's a uh, 3,000, uh, 300 square meters, three bedroom, three in suite baths, Absolutely gorgeous, very modern, brand spanking new, solar power on the roof, never been lived in. The pool is, is 45 foot long and 20 foot wide. Absolutely gorgeous place. And it was built for 400,000 US dollars. That's how much they spent to build it. Now, if you can double that $400,000 and only pay $2,000 a month rent in a year where you want, would you rather, you know, end up with 275,000 in profit on your $400,000 that you own the house? Or would you rather spend the $400,000 and not have to pay the 25,000? You're just way ahead by rent and uh, just do the math. I mean, even through the down years, there's been there's no asset that pays a higher return, a higher kager for the last 15 years, even the last five years. NASDAQ's not even close, and the NASDAQ will only keep your head just barely above the the cost of of inflation plus the cost of debasement of the US currency. So here it makes sense to just rent. Now this house right here and the new house would be about seven or eight thousand dollars a month in Florida. And I know this well. It, it would be seven or eight thousand bucks a month, not two thousand. But you don't, you know, and, and the two thousand rent that includes insurance. I don't have to pay it, includes your homeowner's fees or whatever they call them here. And even if you bought it to rent it out. Who wants a 5% return? You can do that. Just put it in U.S. Treasuries. You can lose money there just as easily with less headache. So I say rent. And, and as I get older, maybe I get to a point, you know, two or three years down the line where this place is too big. Maybe I just want a condo. Maybe I don't want the pool anymore. Maybe I just as soon do something else. Leave. Do what you want, when you want, and how you want. Then you'll be a success in life. That's my only goal. for My goal for success was never how many zeros I could stack up in a bank account. It was how happy can I be doing what I want, when I want, and how I want, and not having the ties any more than a lease. You know, for $4,000, I could break a lease at any time. Just, you know, if I really wanted to go to the Philippines, it cost me 4000 to break a lease. No big deal. Small change. 
if you own the house, you go to the Philippines, what are you going to do? You got to get the house ready to sell. You got to find a real estate agent. You got to find a buyer. You got to go through all the hassle of trying to, you know, sell a house that costs you money to start with. People got to start thinking about, uh, I can't stand the World Economic Forum, but when he said, you own nothing and be happy, well, that can be a choice too. I mean, people look at that, you own nothing and be happy from the World Economic Forum as if it's some form of evil. And, it, and the way they say it, it might be. But I truly can own very little and be happy. I don't have to own property. I've owned property. When I was in my 20s, I had over 200 rental units. And I hated being a landlord. I had multiple, I had multiple single family homes I rented out. I hated being a landlord. You know, I, the only reason I didn't get to Thailand quicker was I had to get rid of property to start with. I don't want no more property. So I want to be unencumbered. That's the reason. I don't think it's a good investment, especially here in Thailand. Especially the freedom aspect is, is a big one. Um, could be an interesting question for you. Um, what's your definition? I, you brought before the, the def definition of success. What is your definition of uh, freedom? My definition of freedom and success are the same exact thing. Because if you can do what you want, when you want, and how you want to do it, you're free. I wish I could, I wish we would get to a point in this world where we would dial it back a bit and get back freedom of thought and critical thinking. You know that the education system in the United States was created by uh, George D. Rockefeller. In 1902, he started the uh, general education uh, GDC. What was the C for? Well, he funded it with, with over a period from like 1902 through 1950s. And his whole thing was to educate the people just smart enough so they would become obedient workers. At the time, we didn't have in the United States the uh, law to send all the kids to school. He wanted them to get up early, come to school every day at the same time so they would become good factory workers, good workers for business. They didn't want to teach them. They didn't want them to be critical thinkers. They didn't want him to be entrepreneurs. John D. Rockefeller later got Carnegie to go in and continue to fund the, this so that he could put together an education system of dumbing down the people of the United States. They didn't want to create scientists. They wanted to create workers. They wanted people obedient who were used to getting up, doing what they were told five days a week, and they got passed through Congress by creating this foundation that they funded. And maybe we'll get to a point in this world where freedom of speech is, is a new right. You know, a countries like Hungary where freedom of speech means something. Poland where, where right of sovereignty and to keep immigrants from illegally entering the country means something. Maybe the world will get off this new world order of totalitarianism and socialism and Marxism, and we'll come back towards the center and we'll have some constructive conversations and we won't hate everybody. I left the United States because half the country hates the other half. It's got so bad. It's like, well, if they, if they vote, if he's in favor of Trump, I don't want him dating my daughter. If she, if she doesn't like Trump, I don't want my son dating her. I mean, Come on, have a conversation about it. Talk about it. Listen, God gave me two ears. God gave you two ears. And by the way, I want to compliment you. You are an excellent host because you let me rant on and you keep your mouth shut and you listen and you don't interject every five minutes. You, you're just a wonderful host that way. If I could be half as good a host as I am a talker, but I'm hoping that the world will change. I only do my YouTube channel because I want to spread good karma. It's my wish that more people 
you know, if, if I ever got word that some guy said, yeah, I heard that rant of yours. And three years ago, I started doing everything I could. I wrote a plan down on paper. I stuck it up on the wall that I was going to get out of debt. And I can tell you right now, I am debt free or I am debt free except for the mortgage on my house. I've got a wife and two kids. We already have the house. We use the house. It's utilitarianism. And, you know, that's the way you buy a house in the United States is with a mortgage, which I'm not totally against if that's what you want to do with your house. I mean, it, it's, totera, it's totally okay if that's the way you want to do raising a family. But if I ever, you know, help somebody to get out of debt, because you cannot get out of a hole unless you stop digging. If you're in the hole now, stop digging. Once you stop digging, then you can start working on steps to get out of the hole and get yourself some wealth. So that later in life, you can live like me. I'm living like a king over here. I'm 69 years old. And I'm fortunate enough to have a girlfriend that's 27 years younger than me and makes me laugh every day. How can you do better than that in life? I laugh, I laugh so hard around here and, and, you know, I'm doing great and I'm not even cute. So, you know, think how good you could do, Robin. You could be over here, lining them up around the block, having a good time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, really cool. <laughs> Mark, I really enjoy our conversation. It's, it's really uh, a pleasure. You're an amazing uh, guest. So, so like uh, a compliment back to you. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast with two questions. The one question is always the same for every guest. Uh, and the question is always the same is what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about in the podcast? I've got an excellent series on how to die broke. I'm a commercially rated pilot. And when they taught me how to fly gliders, they said the secret to flying the glider is we tow you up really high in the air, a couple miles and we let you loose. The secret to flying gliders is you want to run out of altitude and airspeed at the same time you're over a runway. That's the whole secret to flying a glider because you got no motor. You got to run out of altitude and airspeed while you're over the runway. When well, life, I'm trying to die broke because if you run out of money and oxygen, At the same time, you're over a soft place to land. You'll be a real happy camper because it isn't the one who dies with the most toys wins. It's the guy who dies with the most memories and the most laughs and the best time. And if he doesn't have a single Satoshi left to his name and he dies right on the spot, he did it right. Create memories, create experiences, create joy. Smile at somebody who needs to be smiled at. My girlfriend's grandmother came here two days ago. She's 80 years old, looks like she's 100, has never seen the ocean before. Now, I ended up paying for 10 of her family members to come down here. And at least five of them have never seen the ocean. And they went to the ocean and they sat on the chairs under the umbrellas and they went out in the ocean and they waded in the waves. And that brought joy to my heart. Cost money, but it brought joy to my heart. So if, if, if you want to do something in life, die broke. I've got a series of it on my YouTube channel. And, uh, I think that that's the best thing you can do in life. Because if you die with a lot of toys and a lot of money that you didn't spend and, and you didn't have fun, shame on you. Love it so much. Really cool. Um, Mark, now we have an end routine, uh, which will introduce a completely different topic again. Um, we had a previous guest is asking a question uh, for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. So the previous guest had a question for you without knowing actually who you are. And he has an interesting uh, two-part question. The first is, uh, um, what is your strongest belief that you currently have in the U.S. politics? 
And then the second part of the question is, can you steel man this opinion? So like, can you uh, make an argument against your own uh, belief? Wow, good question. Okay, my strongest belief about US politics is I know for a fact that both sides will do anything to win regardless of honesty, both sides. Now, I would say that some sides are better at cheating. And I learned this really early because of my wife that I was with for 35 years. She was really big with the Democrats and she was a national democratic uh, convention delegate. She went to the national convention in 1988. She was really big in, in the democratic side too. Uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. came to town and he borrowed our cars to drive around town in. So when she went down there, she was tuned in. I mean, she donated to him. She donated time. She donated. I had a hundred office phones, hundred phone lines. So late at night, people could come in and do telephone calling, trying to drum up votes. Now I wasn't democratic, but she was. So she went down there and she, they, first thing they told her was how she was going to vote. She said, well, let's talk about this. Let's discuss this and let's take a vote on what our state wants to vote on. They said, no, you're going to vote yes on this and no on that and yes on this and no on that. She says, that's not the way it works. We come down here to discuss our party and the direction we want our country to go in. They said, no, you came down here to sit in the seat and clap when we tell you to clap. If you don't like it, just get the hell out. And we'll put an alternate in your chair. And she did. She left, came back crying, and she never, ever gave him another dime. She said it's the most corrupt thing she ever seen in her life. This was in 1988 when Dukakis was running for the Democratic Party. And the Republican Party is no better. So my wish would be that we, we got back to where honesty meant something in the United States and where people couldn't look at the camera and downright tell the exact opposite of what they know to be true because it benefits their party. What was the second part of your question now? Uh, the second part of, your question, of the question is, um, since this is your biggest belief, um, what would be the argument against that? Like, can you steal man uh, this opinion? Well, this opinion could be steamrolled to the fact that they're lying through their teeth is only my opinion of it. The fact that they're telling what I consider a lie is because I'm delusional, not them. You know, the, the fact that, you know, they can look you square in the eye and tell you that, that th these demonstrations are peaceful while standing in front of a burning police station in the background of the camera shot and say, uh, these demonstrations here in Milwaukee are mostly peaceful and flames are coming out of the police station where they threw Molotov cocktails in, uh, this mostly peaceful, but they're telling this on national TV, then I must be delusional. So I think that asking for an honest politician may never ever happen as long as we as long as we have an adversarial system of government with parties, you know? Uh, and secondly, I don't think most of, of our politicians are very well educated. You know, when you had people who spoke seven languages who founded the United States back in the 1700s, these were educated individuals, thoughtful individuals. And now you have to have a pulse and be a good liar to get elected in the United States. And that's all you need. You got those two qualities, shit, you might be president. All you need is a pulse and be a good liar, baby. So I don't think anything's ever going to happen to improve it. And that's why I believe in the Bitcoin standard that you've got, as long as you invest in a, a few suitcases and have your life on Bitcoin standard so you can get money wherever you are in the world converted to their local fiat currency so you can live, then I think you're free and, and that's the way it goes.
but I don't think it's going to happen that we can get away from liars. And I think that's uh, the, the biggest message, like get get Bitcoin in, in case something happens because there them might actually something happening. Um, really cool. Thank you, Mark, for, for being on the show. Um, for people, before I let you go, for people that want to find you, for people who want to reach out to you, ask questions, uh, listen to your videos, where can they find you? Uh, I have a YouTube channel and it's at sign Mark hyphen Hannah, M-A-R-K-H-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Uh, that's my YouTube channel. I'm also on Twitter at mhanna500. But mostly do the YouTube stuff. Perfect. I will link that uh, down in the description so people can check it out. Thank you so much for the conversation. Also, thank you Am for I everyone. Am I supposed to give you a question for the next guy or did you forget? No, I usually do, do it you, offline, but you can do oh, it now do also. You do it. No, no, no. If you want, I didn't know if you just forgot because I probably did a lousy job of answering your, your questions, but he gave very good questions, by the way. That's very <laughs> hard to do, especially yeah. when the system is messed up as the United States electorate is. Yeah, it was a really good one. Uh, I liked it a lot also. So yeah, thank you for, for being on, Mark. And also thank you for everyone watching and listening for, for being here with us and joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.